Hello and welcome to the Inner Fire Podcast. We're glad you're with us today. We have another compilation episode for you today. This one containing the best stories that we've heard so far. And there have been some amazing ones. These are stories that touch our hearts and strengthen our faith. And we pray that they'll do the same for you. Be sure to stick around all the way to the end to hear a few stories that are just for fun. We hope this podcast is a blessing to you. And then Christmas came, and Salvation Army at Christmas is a horse of a different color, man. Mm. Um, the fundraising efforts for Salvation Army at Christmas are huge and essential. I think everybody knows the bell ringers. Absolutely. That's um, what everybody, when, somebody, when you say Salvation that's Army, what they that know. is the first thing that comes to mind. Right. And that fundraising effort is huge. But one of the big things that it fundraises is a program called Angel Tree. Mm-hmm. And Angel Tree provides oh, full Christmases for kids who would never be able to have Christmas that year. Mm -hmm. So their parents are just at a place where, listen, I don't have it. I lost work, whatever the case may be. Um, And that that first year, the person who'd been helping to organize Angel Tree had had to quit. Mm -hmm. And so Ruthie um, came to me and said, hey, I know you're, you know, you have, you have your regular job right now, whatever, but what about this, right? <laughs> and so, uh, and, and there was a, a point that day, that same day that she was going to be talking to me about that, the day before, I, uh, I was working at a phone company in town just to have, you know, to have employment. And a customer had thrown a phone at me. <laughs> and so when, when I talked sign, to her... A sign, I was a sign from when God. I, exactly. When I talked to her the next morning, I was like, you do not even know. <laughs> like, I, I will call and quit today. <laughs> you know? And so she, she offered me, it was just seasonal, but she offered me like, hey, would you organize this gift program, right, for mm-hmm. hundreds of kids in Cleveland? And, you know, it's seasonal, but you'd get right. paid for it. And I, but man, before she even, I was like, yes. Um, and so I started with Angel Tree and met just incredible families and incredible kids and just a, a community that's so generous. And um, Angel Tree ended and the paycheck ended. And then God said something that was maybe the most frustrating thing that I've ever heard him say. And it was, wait, if that's not the most frustrating thing we hear God say, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. I said, wait. And I said, how long? And he said, wait. (laughs) And so I waited. And um, a month of no work turned into two and then three and Mm. six. And Mm. every time I would try and, like, go out and apply somewhere, God was like, what are you doing? I told you to wait. Mm. (laughs) And we just kept praying and trusting. And there there were several times during that six-month period where God was just teaching us to trust. Um, We had had bills that were coming up. And... There, there would be a, a, there was a, a senior uh, a senior man that was part of our program that did not know any of the details. Came to me one night and said, "God told me to do something weird," hmm. and he said, "You'd understand." And then he said, "I hope you do." <laughs> and he handed me a check. And right before that that small group that Bible study time, Cheryl and I had looked at all of our bills and with rent with all the things it, it came up to a very specific total and that we just didn't have mm-hmm. and so we were like alright God you keep telling us to trust and it, if anything we've learned from the last several months it's that you're faithful so God we trust you with this that night he showed up with a check to the penny for the total bills that we had wow and when I tell you that this grown man wept right and he had no idea <laughs> so he hands me this check and then I'm just like losing it and right. he had no idea what was going on wow um, and but God's faithfulness, trusting Him in that moment, and uh, that check, in fact, that that moment, not only that was one of many. We had people who would um, who would just pause and like drop food off at our house, didn't mm-hmm. even know we needed it, just right, like, right. hey. I had just some passing by, I had, had some extra food, had some and extra, thought of you. right? Yeah. yeah, and just the, like all of those little moments, right. you know, and um, just again, God just keeps speaking, just trust, just trust. Right. And within a month from that, that was kind of the culminating of lots of little moments. Right. And within a month, um, we got a call from the Salvation Army's headquarters that said, hey, we got a grant to create a position in Cleveland mm. um, to help start the Cleveland Salvation Army along with Ruthie. And even Ruthie wasn't, you know, it was just, at, it just came. Right. And so, um, and so, you know, all right, God. 
<laughs> Here we go, right? right? My dad and my mom, they grew up on a family farm in Northwest Ohio. Uh, neither one of them knew Christ as their Lord and Savior. And my dad was drafted to serve in Vietnam, and so he served a tour of service. And there, somebody shared the gospel with him, hmm. and he came to Christ, went back home. He was already married before he went to the service, and uh, shared the gospel with my mom. And of course, that changed their lives. I mean, just transformed not only their lives individually, but their, their family. And they joined a local church in a small town called Paulding, Ohio. Uh, they were baptized in that church. And he just served um, in that church uh, just as a volunteer. He was just a member of that church for a number of years uh, while he worked on the farm. And a missionary came through uh, on a Sunday service and preached a message challenging people to uh, commit their lives for Christian service, full-time Christian service. And uh, him and my mom said yes to that. And so they didn't have any training, so they moved to Tennessee to go to college. And there they uh, were challenged about Brazil, the need in Brazil. So in 1981, I was three years old. Uh, my parents moved all the way to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And really as a kid, that's all I knew. I knew growing up as a kid was the city of Sao Paulo, which is a very large city. Um, and um, you know, just had the privilege of seeing ministry happen in our home. Uh, my dad was a church planner, so really what that meant was invite people into our home, uh, share the gospel with them, disciple those people, uh, raise those people up in Christ, uh, develop leaders, and then move on to the next church plant uh, once that church was established. So I, that's where I trusted in Christ as my Savior, uh, in one of those churches that my dad had planted. I was baptized in that church. And um, for much of my childhood, really it was uneventful. You know, It was eventful in that I was a missionary kid living overseas, but for me, it was just normal life. Right. And up until I was 12 years old, we were coming home from church on a Sunday night in the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, my dad had just started another church on the other side of town, but we still lived an hour away from this church plant. We hadn't yet moved. And so after Sunday service, it was a long track home. And coming home from church, there was a, a car accident in which both of my parents were killed in that accident. And my brothers and I survived the accident, just a miracle of God. Um, there was no EMS at that time in that area of the city. So really passer buyers would pick you up, put you in their car and take you to the hospital. Hmm. And so me and my younger four siblings, we got spread out at different hospitals throughout the city. And even in that, God preserved us. I mean, hmm. so many things could have gone wrong just hmm. in that. Um, yet after a few days, the embassy was able to find us, identify us, and bring us to a central location where we were cared for and uh, missions organizations that my parents worked with at the time uh, really then came in and helped us transition back to the States where I transitioned back to that same, same family farm in Northwest Ohio, living with an aunt and uncle. And, um, you know, as a teenager, as I kind of processed and worked through all of that, I really struggled really struggle. Um, you know, tragedy happens to everyone. Uh, yet, as a Christian, oftentimes we think, well, tragedy shouldn't happen to me. Right. I'm serving the Lord. Right. Um, and as a kid, I was 12. You know, I knew my parents were serving the Lord. And you expect things to work out. And exactly. in that case, you know, they didn't work out. Uh, at, at least in my perspective, they didn't work out. But during my teenage years, God really used a few people to come alongside of me, encourage me, um, mentor me, disciple me, not formally, but just informally, you know, um, conversations here, or there, friends of mine, their parents saw me and they saw me as a kid in need of a parental guidance and you know, so just a lot of people investing in me, and I ultimately came to a point where um, I just saw that everything that happened didn't happen to me. Um, I wasn't a victim of circumstances, but it had happened for me to prepare me for something else in life, you know. And uh, late in my teenage years, I felt really the Lord leading me to full-time Christian service. I didn't know what that looked like, and I didn't even really have any intention of going back to Brazil 
Um, but I just said yes to what God was presenting to me right there. So I went off to college, and even in college, I didn't start out with this in mind that, hey, I'm going to pursue missionary service. Uh, but I was studying. I was studying to be a history teacher, and uh, it was spring break, and I had a friend in the dorms who lived in Clearwater, Florida, and we were looking for a place to go on spring break, and and he said, hey, I live, in spring, I live in Clearwater. Why don't you guys come down and spend some time with us? And it was a free place to stay near a beach. And so I said, great, let's go. And his dad was a pastor, a Baptist pastor uh, in Tampa. And as I stayed in their home, he, he heard my story. And he said, hey, I go to Brazil uh, every summer to speak in churches. And I'm always looking for somebody to go with me to help. And if you speak Portuguese already, why don't you help translate? And I said, great. It was a free ticket for a college student to go to South America. <laughs> Who wouldn't sign up for something like that? And so summer came around. Uh, he was true to his word. He bought the ticket, had me along. And I'll never forget it. We uh, went to the hotel. A pastor picked us up at the hotel. And we drove to this first church uh, where he was going to speak. And it was the church that my dad had planted. Wow. Uh, unbeknownst to this pastor, unbeknownst to me that I was actually going to be there, and really unbeknownst to those people. And what happened in that, that week, those few days that I was there, was this. God galvanized in me this idea that it's not only not about you, it wasn't about your parents, mm. it's about what I'm doing, what mm. God's doing. Uh, here was a church established in which many of the people didn't know me. Um, they didn't know my parents, but they did know Jesus. And, and, and ultimately, all of our stories can be forgotten and probably should be forgotten. Mm. As long as at the end of the story, people remember who Jesus is. Right. And so it, it just kind of allowed me, it, God kind of just pulled back the curtain and allowed me to see what he had done in all those years in which my parents weren't there, but he still was. He was still working. And I guess it was, it was about then where I said, you know, this is what I want my life to count for. I want to be a part of something in which I can be part of something greater than myself. Um, and so I came back to the States. Um, I was towards the end of my four years in college, so I still stayed as a, as a history major but decided to finish off with this commitment to go back uh, to Brazil to serve as a missionary. Um, at the time, I was engaged. We got married shortly after uh, graduation. I moved here to Nashville and our sending church here in Nashville a few years later then commissioned us to go back to Brazil as missionaries. My 18th birthday came on March 25th of my senior year of high school. You know, I had decided to change my last name to mm. kind of honor my mom and her father. Mm -hmm who had passed away a couple of years prior. And, and quite frankly, I was tired of explaining why I had a different last name than my mom. Right. And uh, she walked into my bedroom on my birthday that morning before school and she handed me a piece of paper and she's like, you're a man now. And I'm like looking around like, I am? <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm feeling different than I did yesterday. What do you mean I'm a man? She's like, no, you're, you're 18. You know, legally you're an adult. And so, you know, th this is now your decision. And so she gave me a piece of paper with my father's name and uh, the last address and telephone number she had for him. Mm. And I was just like, whoa, you know, what do I do with this? And I think I've seen this on Oprah Winfrey before, you know, I could, <laughs> I could be on a reunion show. Right, you know? right. But of course I'm also, you know, thinking, you know, this is a little scary, but I'm also thinking this phone number is, you know, probably 17 years old. Mm. There's no way it's gonna work. Right. But I sat on it for a couple of weeks and, you know, talked to Mac, you know, talked mm -hmm. to other people in my life, you know, sought their counsel, and finally got the courage to dial these numbers and uh, I was born in Mineola, New York, on Long Island, and uh, dialed the phone number, and sure enough, this guy with a really deep, thick Long Island accent picks up the telephone mm. and says hello, and I'm like, I'm Tommy Rhodes, I'm looking for Robert Rhodes, I think I may be his son. And uh, as I recall, the first thing out of his mouth was, I tried to find you till you were nine. Mm. And it just kind of changed everything, you wow. know just that one statement mm -hmm. and so just to know that he wanted a relationship with me mm -hmm. you know is really powerful and so we got pretty close pretty quick just mm -hmm. over the phone he ended up coming to my high school graduation mm -hmm. uh, which was really cool and uh, I was vice president of my class so I got to lead the commencement in 
mm -hmm. you know, with the president in the middle of the Nashville Convention Center with thousands of people there. Everybody had heard what was happening. Mm. And uh, as vice president, my job was to get up on stage and, and welcome friends and family. Right. So that was the first student speech, right. you know, at the right. ceremony. And so the irony wasn't lost on me. Oh, yeah. Just standing up there on that stage and just kind of seeing my dad you know, sitting there. That mm. uh, was pretty surreal. Now, did, had you met your dad before the graduation, or was this the first That was, was the it. First he got time? off the plane, walked into the convention center, and I walked wow. right past him and wow. yeah, knew it was him because he was sitting with my family. So they, they had connected, you know, yeah. before the ceremony and sat together, which was incredibly awkward as well. Yeah. Uh, but just sitting in the midst of all that was really powerful. And so the Lord really gave me some sweet moments with him. After my freshman year of college, you know, I really wasn't sure what to do, and mm -hmm. he taught me into coming up to New York to work in the family business, and so his brother had married into an Italian family, mm -hmm. and uh, they worked with Central Queens Dry Ice, and so I started working for the Dry Ice Company, going to LaGuardia and JFK, breaking down pallets of fish, and then delivering to Fulton Street Fish Market wow. you know, each morning at like 2.30, 3 That sounds like a fun one. <laughs> it was an adventure for a Tennessee boy, you know, I'm sure, being yeah. up there. Uh, but we had some really sweet moments that God gave us. Um, I remember one day he asked me, you know, what, what's your favorite movie? And I said, Field of Dreams. Mm. He said, mine too. And I'll never forget, I mean, he looked wow. at me and just literally said, do you want to have a catch? You know, and it was mm -hmm. just like tears, you know, welling up. And we went out just in the street in mm -hmm. front of the house that I was born in and mm. uh, had a catch. And uh, both of us were kind of taking a step back you know, with each right, throw, right. you know, because it was such an emotional moment. Oh, yeah, uh, but unfortunately, my dad was a, a drug addict, and he was a, a medic in Vietnam, as I understand it, and marijuana was kind of a, a classic gateway drug, mm -hmm. and it escalated, and that kind of led uh, to their divorce, and my mom, mm -hmm. you know, and ultimately taking me and kind of starting over again, mm -hmm. you know, in Alabama. And he told me that I'd lost uh, three half-brothers to his drug addiction, Mm -hmm. uh, as well that, you know, I never met. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, at the end of the summer, you know, I found my father using uh, with my friend that I brought with me. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I mean, that was a heartbreaking, just devastating moment because I felt like, you know, I'd been around addicts, you know, growing up, but I'd never really been able to have an honest conversation, you know, with an addict. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was something my dad and I could do. Mm -hmm. and it was just so refreshing to have that transparency and just to help understand not only him, but other addicts in my mm -hmm. life. And mm -hmm. I just really appreciated that. But then to walk in on that, it just felt like, I don't know if I can believe anything you've ever shared with me. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately that led me to summer camp the following mm -hmm. summer. And so the Lord really used that moment and, right. and healed a lot of things in me, mm -hmm. you know, just by having that moment. And a lot of our campers, you know, that come to Barefoot Republic, they don't have fathers, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously a lot of those boys would do anything just to have a catch. Right, you know, so right. just looking back on it, you know, I'm so grateful that mm -hmm. I had any time with him whatsoever. Right. Our only son was 18, and he came to me in the darkest hour and said, uh, Dad, um, I know you and Mom are trying to figure this out, um, but my sisters and I are dying in this house. Mm -hmm. So whatever you need to do to stop it, Dad, it's okay. He said, Dad, divorce could not be worse than this. Mm. And, and Scotty, we had no chance of survival. I mean, we had none. I mean, we had no chance of survival. Um, and the spirit of the living God that I did not know existed mm. gave us a seat, gave us a front row seat at the Red Sea and he parted the Red Sea right in front of us. Let me, let, me, let me share something that's really important. It just crossed my mind. In, in, in all the darkness and all the confusion, I was sitting with Gail Haywood, who was on staff at uh, the church we attended. And I was sitting with her at lunch one day, one, one weekday. And I have no recollection of the conversation. I was I was flailing. I was trying to find some sense of some some sense of balance and orientation. And before I left, she said, "Can I pray?" And Scotty, I have no, I can't tell you a single word she said, but she began praying to someone who was in the room. Hmm. She began speaking to someone who was in the room. And I, in my early 40s, in church, 
since I was an infant, in church virtually every Sunday of my life, heard Gail Haywood speaking personally to somebody in the room. And I sat there and I thought to myself, Gail Haywood knows something that I do not know. Mm. I thought God was long distance. And I heard, really my ears heard for the first time in my life that God, God in the spirit, fully God in the spirit was present in that room. There's a window of time, it's months, it's difficult, but there's a window of time for a period of months that God breathes in our house. The Spirit of God breathes in our house. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in my life, after 40 years in church, 20 plus adult years in church, mm -hmm. preaching on Youth Sunday, preaching on Layman Sunday, everything that one could do in church, I had done everything, but I did not know that God was present. I did not have a meaningful personal walk, daily walk with the Spirit of God. And so um, it, it's life altering. And, and, and really I said when we first sat down that there, there are two stages of my life and that is the moment that begins the second. Right. Just as I was brought to nothing in that West Texas cotton field setting, I was again brought to nothing this time in Times Square mm. on New Year's Eve, you know, if, and that's literally where it happened. Yeah. I, I called my wife and I was, we were getting ready to play in front of a million and a half people in person, not to mention the hundreds of millions on TV, and right before the ball dropped, and I remember telling Hannah, I was like, look, something's going on, this, this isn't working out the way that I thought it was, and I'm telling Hannah, like, if, if tonight, when I get off that stage, if that hasn't done it for me, then uh, I'm done. There's got to be something else. And so I remember stepping off that stage and looking around, and I didn't know the theology behind it. I wasn't theologically mature. But I remember looking around at all of that glitter and all of those flashing lights and all those screaming people and looking at it, and in my heart I said, it's worthless. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely worthless. And so I didn't even stay for the ball dropping out. <laughs> I mean, I, I played Times Square on New Year's Eve, but I didn't even watch the ball drop. I went back to my hotel room. I called Hannah. She was waiting for my call, and I said, I'm done. Are you okay with that? And she says, yeah, I'm okay with that. And so I actually sat down at the computer that night, and I was wide awake, and I opened up my own MacBook, and I've been working on this little bluegrass guitar song, and I thought, I'm going to make a little video, and maybe teach people how to play this if they ever wanted to learn how to play it. And I made this video and I uploaded it to YouTube. You did that in I did in that New in York. that hotel room that night. New Year's Eve night. And that video now has hundreds <laughs> of thousands of views. Great. And, um, and that was, I didn't realize it, but that was the beginning mm -hmm. um, in some form of what the Lord was going to have me do for the next however long he has me doing this. So, is that, so at 18 or 19, you're living a life of petty crime, uh, drug use, uh, in and out of relationships. I mean, instability. You know, living from one couch to another, you know, from one automobile wreck to another. I mean, that's just pretty well much normal life for me at that point. Right. Yeah, instability is an understatement. Yeah. Ca chaos. Yeah, chaos. A yeah. life of chaos. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and just uh, no direction, no, yeah, just empty life. Yeah, just existing. Mm. Well, at the age of, uh, Around the age of 19, I, I fell in love with this lady. And, uh, you know, I fell in love with her part and parcel because I felt like she understood me. You know, you know, we had a relationship. But unfortunately, this lady, uh, she didn't have that kind of love for me. And she was, you know, actually uh, very promiscuous. And as you can imagine, someone who would trust their heart to a promiscuous lady, there's lots of turmoil that comes from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, it led me down a string of more serious crimes where I had... Uh, you know, took out some of my anger and aggression in a situation and got charged with aggravated assault. Well, then from there I was, uh, you know, I made bond and uh, was kind of out on my own. My court date came. I didn't go to my court. I was running from the police. And uh, it just run me, I mean, I, as, as chaotic as we described earlier 
I went, I went probably three degrees beyond that even. So let's pause right there for just a second. Uh, what does that? What does a life like that feel like? Uh, because you know, I, I know many of our listeners probably have not experienced a life like that. We look at people like that, and sometimes we. We draw conclusions, we make assumptions, mm. but what is it like to be in a lifestyle like that? That's a good question. Um, I would just, the first word that comes to my mind is numb. Mm. You're just numb. I mean, I, I, I could total a car to, you know, today, get out, walk out, leave the car behind, and start the next morning, wake up and everything, nothing about it. Mm. So, you know, or I could be in a relationship with a, a, a person from one night to the next and just and everything. It's just a numb life. You just going through motions and and drugs you, you, drugs is a part of it because that's your that's how you how you cope with it all mm. you know if you don't have something to numb your mind and mm -hmm. numb your soul you how could a person even cope with such a life right yeah right okay well that's, that's a very good that's a very good explanation so yeah okay so I'll pick back up on your story there. so anyways uh this led to you know and i i went through a um a time and then the police finally caught me and when they caught me um I had, man, I, part of, you know, something bleeding into making this three st stages stronger of instability mm -hmm. was I w had gotten with this lady, and this lady was on a, uh, a, a mental, emotional drug called Klonopin, and, you know, she had a, you know, backfill scripture of these for, you know, months, and, and I got to taking this drug, you know, just like Skittles, as you would say, mm -hmm. and uh, so you can imagine, I'm just, you know, kind of out of my mind already, but then I'm influenced by, you know, a mind psychological you know emotional drug and just taking them just by you know and this this string went on for about two weeks well finally the police did they pulled me over i was driving and and uh, of course the custom back in those days was when you got pulled over you didn't just get out and you put them on a little run you know and so i did that and they caught me and drug me in and um and when i went to jail i mean it was just there was just something within me i, I don't know if you know, demon possession and spirit, there's a lot of untold stuff in the scripture, but there was obviously something speaking to me in a very, I, I, I kind of just felt like a wild animal caged, honestly. Mm. And I just felt like there's no way, I was looking at three years, I thought there's no way in the world I can stay here for three years. No way possible. You got to do something. I mean, just hear this voice, you got to do something, you got to do something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my move was to tell the uh, jailers, because early on I had already had some suicide attempts in my life and so I thought you know I can use that as a, a card as leverage I'll tell the jailers that and maybe they'll take me back to the mental hospital that give me a room to mm -hmm. space to run again mm -hmm. and so it didn't happen like I planned uh, matter of fact I told the jailers and they came back and they called my name and I they said get your stuff and I thought wow it worked a whole lot easier than I thought you know well then they they I got all my stuff and they threw me in a cell it's like a four by six cell nothing but steel and concrete and it called the hole and uh, it just had a door where they fed you through the door and um, <clears throat> so it, I was in the hole here and and I'm thinking this didn't turn out like I thought it would mm -hmm. and then all the while that voice is you know speaking to me and it's just you know and this is what they're not taking you for real. They don't think you're serious. And so, of course, your next conclusion is what? Right. Well, I'll prove them wrong, right. you know? And so, uh, so somehow I, I had taken my shoelaces and my sheet and I rigged it up and, and, I, and I attempted to hang myself in the cell. And, um, and that, that was a bad mistake because when that happened and the police came in and the guards came in and saw that, they, of course, cut me down and then took everything that was in that cell Every stitch of clothing I had, everything. It was nothing but skin, bones, steel, and concrete in that cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, and kind of breaks the guy down, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, that's an understatement, brother. You, mm -hmm. You'd have to be there to experience to understand that depth right. of that. Right. But anyways, so here I am, and you know, and the guards. I, at that time, I was completely out of my mind. I'm sure part of it was withdrawals from that drug, mm -hmm. and part of it was you know just demonic influence in my life, and I was out of my mind. I beat the cell. The people who were back in the cell who weren't in the hole with me but were nearby a cell, they hated me because I kept them up all night. I was just like a lunatic, you know. Mm. And uh, they would, they would, when they come and get their tray, they would throw urine in through the hole at me mm. because they hated me that bad. They couldn't get to me. Right. And man, we holler stuff back and forth and, and uh, you know, and the guards hated me. And one guard came in one time and told me, he said, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to take you by the legs and use you like a bat on these walls, you know, and it's mm. just, just horrible. And uh, so the guards, what they did do, because they couldn't physically harm me that way, they turned the air conditioner totally cold. And so here I am in the cell, I've got, you know, no clothes, you know, steel and concrete, and then just freezing air. Well, <clears throat> I began to use my toilet paper as a means to, to get warm. Hmm. Well, when the guards seen that, you know what they did? Took the toilet paper. Took the toilet paper. And so then, I mean, you're talking about humility, brother. Uh, you know, you're sitting there, you know, stark naked, you know, women coming. You know, if you need toilet paper, you have to ask for toilet paper. That's, that's where I was. And finally, you know, but Scotty, that's what it took for God to break me and begin to get into my life. You take somebody from back there, their life is so out of order, so chaotic. How, how can God ever reach a person like that? And it's by breaking you know, God has to break us, and uh, so that's what He was doing in my life, and and so uh, I was sitting there in this cell, in this condition. I'd been in this condition. Uh, yeah, I couldn't hardly sleep because I was so cold. I only took like ten minute naps, just from kind of passing out from just mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. sleeping. It's and, exhaustion. And back in Boo, I'd beaten the walls, and and this man, Bobby Tyson, came by. He was going to minister to those guys on a Sunday morning. He and some other ministers were going past my cell block to minister to these guys on a Sunday morning and he came back and he said, uh, he, he came back and he looked inside my, he looked inside a little thing and he said, yo man, how did you get yourself in this condition? Mm -hmm. You know? And man, it, and uh, well, let me back up. Before he came to that cell when they were back there, I began to pray, God if you're real, because you know, really if, at this point in my life, I would have said that I don't even believe God's real, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. I mean, I thought, you know, my life is empty. I'm numb. I'm just coping with life. God seems so far from me, so distant. I said, God's not real. You know, sure. if, you'd, if we'd have had a conversation, I just said, I don't think, I've never seen him. I ne and no help to me. And, right. you know, and so I, when, when those ministers went past my cell to go minister to the other guys, I, I began to pray. And I said, God, if you're real, have one of the ministers to stop here and talk to me. Hmm. That simple. And so uh, when, when they passed by my cell, you know, I prayed that. And I sat there, and it seemed like I waited eternity. And then one minister went out, and the door shut behind him. Another minister went out, and the door shut behind him. I remember I, maybe three or four guys. And then fi finally when I, what I thought was the last one went out and shut the door, I thought, yeah, that's right. I didn't think he was real. And no more had that thought, maybe even spoke those words, did Bobby Tyson bend down and open up the, the, the tray slot and speak to me and it's like wow you know and so it was this question to me yo man how'd you get yourself in this condition how, how'd you end up here and i don't remember our conversation but he talked about god's forgiveness and pretty much my in my mind's eye at that point was you know i had my one shot with god back there at the pentecostal church mm -hmm. and i've blown it totally right you know there's no hope for me and that's what i told us uh, you know uh bobby i said bobby uh you know, all this sounds good, but, you know, I had my shot with God, and I've blown it. It's done, you know. And, uh, and, and Bobby then, I can't remember the exact conversation, but then he emphasized to me, no, God don't work like that. He's not a God of one chances, but he's a God of multiple chances. Mm. And it gave me hope, and uh, I needed hope in that time of my life. And uh, So anyways, Bobby left, and uh, I had never really read the Bible. Um, I never really read the Bible. But, you know, I, I always thought, you know, if I did think of the Bible, I thought it was the most boring book in the world. <clears throat> and uh, my neighboring cell next to me was a hole as well. And this guy next door to me, I would get under my bunk. There was a hole in between our cells, and I would lay in my bunk, and I'd talk to him. Hmm. And I remember I'd just become so bored. Uh, I just I was bored out of my mind. I said, man, have you got a book or anything over there to read? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and... And the man said, he said, no, I don't know. So I've got this little this little Bible, you know. I said, well, pass it over to me. I'm so bored, I'll even read the Bible. <laughs> and so he, he pushed this little Gideon Bible through that hole. Mm -hmm. And I began reading. And I thought, where do, where do you read the Bible? Now, I knew enough about my influence at church that the, the last book of the Bible is Revelation. Mm -hmm. It's a revelation that's about the end of times. And I thought, well, there's got to be some excitement there. And Scotty, as I began reading through Revelations, I, I described it as almost as, as, as real as those voices were to me and mm -hmm. telling me to do the things I were doing. It became as real to me, the book of Revelations, as the horses running through the cell that you read about in judgment. 
I mean, it, God really revealed Himself to me, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I knew that God was real. And I knew that uh, the world would stand in judgment of God one day. Mm. That I would stand in judgment of God one day. And so, based upon that, I kind of made a deal with God. I said, well, God, basically I said, well, God, you know, I'll do what you want me to do. Um, you know, but in turn, you know what I wanted? I wanted this lady back mm. in my life that, you know. And so, yeah, I kind of made a deal with God and started reading the Bible. And within a couple of days, you know, I was out of the hole. I was in population. Mm. And I would have probably thought of myself to be a Christian at that point. And it was on Halloween night that uh, we all went into Lahaina. This is the town of Lahaina. Maui. Um, I drove with the, the woman that invited me there, uh, her boyfriend, and then another woman. Um, her name is Kitty. And um, when I was at this place, there were certain nights that I'd go to sleep and I felt, um, I felt this spirit, this dark, oppressive spirit that was there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the place. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know where it came from or this or that, but it was there. Right. And there was probably about 30 people living in this commune, which right. is what it was. Right. And um, anyhow, there was a number of times that I remember before this night that I would think about God. I would think mm -hmm. about, I would just think about God. Mm -hmm. Um when I would feel this oppressiveness as I'm going to bed. It would always happen at night. So anyway, Halloween night, we drive into Lahaina, where we all dress up. So I was dressed up as an Indian. And uh, so we all go in there, and this other sister commune, so join them, and it winded up being like 50 people. Uh, and they have like little bongos and, um, what do you call it? Um, shakers, rattles, uh, shakers, and everything, yeah. Uh, yeah. tambourines, and, uh -huh. uh, and they're all dressed up in kind of fanfare, mm -hmm. um, like kind of one though, you know. Well, they're in town, and they're they form a circle, and they're doing this chant, and people. I mean, there's thousands of people in Lahaina mm -hmm. on Halloween night. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, they're going to and fro, and people are stopping, checking out this exhibition. You know? Right, right. And um, my eyes saw, it was crazy. I remember looking, I wasn't in the circle. I was outside, like the people watching. And I saw what they were doing, and I, could, I sensed it, I knew it, I felt it. And they would call on down spirits into these people that were in the middle. It was nuts. I know you're hearing that for the first time. Mm -hmm. You're kind of like, mm -hmm. you know. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a spirit world out there, right? Yeah. A lot of people either deny it or they uh, acknowledge that it exists. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's biblical, mm -hmm. and we don't, want, it's, we don't want a wrong relationship to the spirit world, right? I mean, no. we, we, want, we want God in our life. We want the Holy Spirit in yeah. our life. But there is a, another well, he side tells of that us. fence, right? I mean, I mean, it's clear in Scripture. What did Jesus do? Most yeah. He cast most, out demons. Yeah, most people just don't get in the middle of it and have the kind of experience that you're, Correct. you're talking about. But right. that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So this so. is the whole point of why God chose that place, hmm. that night, would be my night. Hmm. And what he did was he literally just pulled back the curtain and that I would see spiritual warfare mm -hmm. that exists and specifically over my own soul mm. so the night ended a couple of hours later and um, I remember meeting up with everybody in the park a lot and, and Aaron and um, Sue were packed in like sardines into one of these old 1969 uh, Volkswagen mm -hmm. vans mm -hmm. and you know they're it's just packed of people that are going to go back to right. uh, Akua is the name of it. Um, that was the name of the place, Hale Akua. Um, and it means House of God. It was a missionary hmm. uh, place at one time. Originally, yeah. Originally, that's what it was, yeah. 
I don't know what it is now. But anyhow, I get to the van and I say, let me in. I want to come in. And they're like, no, 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 no. You just drive back with Kitty. And I'm like, uh, I don't really thought, I, no, 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 no. I don't want to. I want to go, I want to go with you guys. Because I knew she was part of the source. Mm-hmm. And, um, they were, and Sue said, uh, you know, we'll meet you back there. It's only an, a little over an hour. We'll meet you back there. So they close the door and they take off. And she's standing behind me. So I got into her uh, Cadillac and uh, we started driving back. And um, um, she started talking to me, and I had an anger towards her. And I told her, I was like, "Look, just, just don't talk, don't talk to me. All right, I don't want to talk to you. We'll just drive back." And I think it was because I, I sensed, I knew what had happened, what mm-hmm. I saw mm-hmm. came from her, mm-hmm. but she had something to do with it. Right, right. So that's where I, I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be near her. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So as we're driving, she's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. The next thing I know is I'm screaming. Hmm. Yeah, it's just I'm in complete torment in my mind, my whole being. There's something that's just come taken, over you. Come over, taking over. Yeah. Hmm. And. Uh, it was the most vile, uh, disgusting, evil. I mean, if you think about when Jesus, when the Bible describes the torment these people were in. Mm-hmm. That's what I experienced. Wow! In that brief moment, mm. and um, I felt like I had retreated to like just the last little sane thought in my brain that I could think. Mm-hmm that did what's happening to me. And um, I said in my mind, God, if this is how you want me to die, then this will be the way I die. And I literally screamed what I thought was my last breath. Hmm. And I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm dying right now. Right. And I'm going to just, whatever, combust. That's what it felt like. It was so much death. Hmm. It just it was death. You know, how do you, how do you think you're going to die? I don't know. I was just going to die. I was going to just die Mm because death was all over me. And so when I screamed and then I said what I said in my mind, it was instantaneous. It was the most miraculous thing I ever felt in my life. It will be, I know I will talk to Jesus about it when I see him. (laughs) Um, But it was the Holy Spirit, instantaneous. That evil spirit was gone. It was out of me. And the Holy Spirit was over me. And I was in the car. And I remember I had my hands clenched like this. And I had my eyes closed. And what I think was about seven minutes long, um, I just had, I was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I did. Straight for seven minutes. As I'm getting this download Hmm. of God speaking to me Hmm. in my mind and telling me, that it was time for me to come out of the dark, that I was um, that I was playing in the park of dark, that he knew me all my life, that if you say you, you say me. If you say me, you say you. Telling me that that was how connected I am to him. Mm-hmm. Um, he talked about um, how he had been with me through the times that I wanted him back, wanted him in my life, um, that from this day forward things were going to be different, um, that I would live for him, um, that I would have power in him over darkness, that I, I now possess the power over darkness in my life. It was it was crazy. I mean, here's you know all of a sudden I get this, you know, mm-hmm. it's like. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty radical difference oh, from the... I don't share it a whole lot. <laughs> well, I just live my life now. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it sounds like a Damascus Road experience. It was. That's what I do say that. Right? I do say that. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, uh, you were in darkness and... Yes, sir. And miraculously, God showed up and really shined a, shined a light into your, into your life. And into my soul. You. Right. 
So, um, so finally, you know, again, the Spirit of God speaks to me, tells me things of my future, talks about the, His kingdom, talks about heaven, and talks about Judgment Day. Um, and then, again, you know, I'm not biblical, so I know nothing of this, you know. Mm -hmm. So, then the Spirit kind of lifts off, and then it's like normal again. Mm -hmm. And the woman the where this mm -hmm. spirit came out of was driving. And during the time that that seven minutes, I can hear her making sounds like, oh, or, oh, like I can mm -hmm. hear. Mm -hmm. Gasping and just kind of. Because she was getting it too. She mm. was hearing it. I, I can't explain it. Mm -hmm. But I know, you know, I never really like asked her. You know, mm -hmm. I never saw her again really after that night. Something was happening in her while it was I happening felt, in I you. I knew that. I knew that. So as soon as, when the spirit lifted, I looked at her. And the first thing I say to her is, it's for you too. That's the first thing I said. <laughs> I, and then I said, take it. You can have it too. That's what I said. <laughs> I really did. First of all, she leases this dog out on me. Now I'm going to tell you, it's for you too. <laughs> it's like, okay, God's already at work. And I'm not kidding. That's exactly what happened. And... I could, and she's kind of like, like this, and mm -hmm. she's kind of looking at me a little bit like that, and I could see her thinking, processing, right? You know, and I looked at her with all whatever she was wearing. Um, I could see her as a child, hmm. as without this thing, right, right. And I could see her thinking, and I'm not kidding, her whole body just jerked right back, and she was gone. Hmm. It's like she went boom. And it was back in her. Hmm. Right back to the state she'd been in before. Yeah. This thing was back in her. She was possessed again. Wow. No question. Because as I go back here, I start thinking about, this. so she's gone. She's driving. Mm -hmm. And we're driving to this place. Right. You know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And I come back here to myself, and I'm thinking about what just happened to me. Mm -hmm. What just happened? My, my life just changed. God just rescued me. I was dying. I just gave my life over. I was dead. Hmm. I literally took a breath thinking I was crossing over. You've never experienced it. I died. I died. Hmm. I honestly died because I let it all go. Mm -hmm. And I believed I was crossing over. Hmm. So now I'm still alive. <laughs> Much to your surprise. <laughs> and it's like, okay, what, what do I do now? Right. What, what's going on? Exactly. You know? And I'm thinking about just what happened, and it's beautiful. I'm thinking beautiful thoughts. I'm thinking, thank you again, you know, just praising him, and I don't know anything about it, you know? Hmm. And then I feel this thing right here. This is as, far, as close as it could come. I could feel it. And I just pointed, and I said, stop! And I felt it just suck right. This is where it gets kind of strange with people like, okay, he's on drugs. I'm telling you, <laughs> this is, I was allowed, this was allowed to happen to me. I experienced it. It was real. Listen, wake up. You know, there's, a, we all, those of us that believe that when you die, it's not the end of life, that we actually go to eternal life, mm -hmm. to the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Well, it exists here. Right. We're spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, just read the Bible. Talk to all about it. Right, it does. And that window was open to me. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. You know, it was rough. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, it's one thing I always have thought about. Those guys that were delivered in the biblical times mm -hmm. doesn't really track anyone's life after that. Right, right. But it was different. Their lives were different. And, right. And trust me, when you come out of something like that, it just... Um, it would be it would be interesting to know some of those that were demon yeah, possessed I would in, have loved in the that Bible moment. that Jesus cast well, the demons out. Help <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done it right. Listen, yeah. here's the deal. You know, Jesus doesn't change. He's the same. He's always there and he's always enough. Right. The Lord's always enough. And so that's what I've experienced the last thirty years. It's been thirty years now. Just wow. about. Yeah. So my brother, uh, he was like I say, newborn, brand spanking new kid. And at some point, he, he couldn't breathe very well. And, uh, and so they were trying to, mom and dad was trying to figure out what was going on. And, and suddenly his, 
his arms were turning blue and his legs were turning blue. So they took him to the hospital and, uh, and they said, they said they didn't know what was going on. And so on the way back from, we was come bringing him home from the hospital and dad was freaking out a little bit. And mom was freaking out. And Eli, I mean, uh, Doug was laying in the center of the front seat, just laying there between mom and dad. And I was, I remember looking over at him in from the back seat and we got, we got to this point where we crossed from Arkansas into Missouri hadn't, we lived in Missouri at that time. So we crossed over the bridge, the river there. And right after you crossed the bridge, there was a, there was a right hand blacktop road. So my, instead of going home, my dad turned right and went down this, down this blacktop road. It's just fields out there, a few farmers and houses out there scattered. And my mom said, what are you doing? He said, dad said, I don't know. He said, I, he said, it felt like the wheel turned and I couldn't stop it. Hmm. And she's like, well, okay, well, what are you doing? <laughs> Where are we going? He said, I don't know. He said, I, I just felt the wheel turn. And we went down and there was a lady that came to our church at that time, lived on a, in a little country house out there. And, and he put, he pulled right into her yard. And this lady was, she was one of our prayer warriors. We call them, you know, back in those days. And uh, he pulled up in her front yard. And as soon as he pulled up, she, she ran out the front door, ran out the front door and said, bring that baby in here. Hmm. Like nobody called her and told her we, you know, she said, bring that baby in here. And so we got in there and gathered around and, and suddenly there was a few of the neighbors were there. I don't know where they came from, but everybody was around my brother praying. And, and just in a minute or two, his arms turned back to the right color and his legs turned back and he was breathing okay again. And her name was Juanita. This lady's name was Juanita. And, uh, she said, she said, I dreamed last night about a little boy that was, whose arms and legs were turning blue and that he was brought here and I prayed for him. And, I, and sure enough, that's what happened. I mean, I was there. I saw it all go down. And so she had that dream the night before. So when she ran out of the house, said, bring that baby in here. She already knew what was going on. Hmm. And he was healed from that time on. And he, he grew up to be a big man. He's, he outweighs me 50 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, whatever. And I, and, and I, and I do believe, I mean, it, and my mother's asked him over the years, son, when, when did you get saved? And he went, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember getting saved. And my, I think my dad told me that not too long ago, he said, I think the Lord told me that your brother was saved when he was healed at two months old. He was saved when he was healed. And I thought, you know what? That makes sense to me. And because if he don't remember it, then, but I, you know, I know he's a Christian. I know he, he's a devout, loves the Lord Christian. And so I just, uh, that was, that was the way it went down. He was healed right before my face. I'll, I'll swear to it till my dying day. And well, people, pre- people want to pass stories like that off, you know, in our, in our modern technological intellectual day. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if, if God wasn't supernatural, then why would we serve him yeah. and worship him and pray to him? And if we can't expect great things from him, you know, he's, he, he's doing miracles. He's doing miracles around us all the time. And if we're tuned in to him, if we seek him first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we'll see these miracles start taking place around our lives. If we're, but if we're blind to it, if we're, if we're shut, you know, if we're not seeking him first, then we're going to be blind to the miracles that are going on around us. Right. They happen around me all the time. Miracles all the time, just mm-hmm. through my daily hanging out happen to me all the time i see them everywhere i look and they're simple things you know it might be a simple thing but but it gets your attention you go oh that's interesting you know that's interesting mm-hmm. and and then you start seeing this stuff every day all day long my neighbor was an engineer at one of the radio stations i'm on mm-hmm. and he wasn't a christian good person but he wasn't a christian 
and he got cancer, and I would try. I would go over and mow his yard, I'd do things for him to help him, mm -hmm. and uh, I was able to lead him to the Lord. Mm. And I started back over the next day. I was going to read him some scripture, and there's a car there, and I said, "Well, I'll go back later." But something uh, is impressed me to go on, so I went on. It was a therapist there. And and so we talked, and and um, he he told me this this shook me to the, I mean, to, uh, it really hit me hard. He hmm. said, "I've been watching you, and you're the first person I ever seen that I thought was a real Christian." Hmm. And it, it hit me. I never forgot it to this day. I've been watching you. Right. And. There's somebody watching you, right? Uh, and uh, and he had confidence enough that I was able to talk to him. He's in heaven now. Wow! And uh, so that's that's what it's all about. And just working for the Lord, and uh, and that's what we try to do with these girls. There was a situation with a former student had some mental issues, um, and he had gotten um, he'd gotten violent, and he had a weapon. Mm. And he showed up on our property, and um, I went out to try and just kind of talk him out, talk him out, defuse him. And he, he, you know, wielding his weapon around and very unstable. And then mm. God says, and I like clearly, God says he needs you to go hug him. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I don't, I don't right. know yeah. that he yeah, does. I don't want to get in that space. Yeah. And then he he gets, I get a little closer, and he gets more angry, and he. I, I've never been cussed out like that in my life. Every name under the book, every curse word you could imagine just mm -hmm. thrown at me, right? Mm. And even old stuff, like old hurt that, that pops out, right? The things that I, I I struggled with in middle school about who I am and my perception, that the enemy used that in that moment, wow. giving a sharp tongue to just right. attack, attack, attack. And God says, hug him. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't think this is it. Right. And then the third time, I mean, it was like he was yelling inside my head. God's like, hug him. And so I was like, even if, okay, God, I just got to trust you. And when I tell you, as I, I walked up to him, I, I just said, I love you. I love you. And I reached around. That weapon dropped. This kid melted just into a puddle of tears. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, God, right? You know, like, that was a moment where I was not, <laughs> I, I don't know that I was ready for either end of that outcome. Right, right. But it, it just became such a, when you listen to God, he will press where he needs you to press. Mm. And it's just being open and available to him. Mm. And, and not shut him off when it's inconvenient. Right. Because it's always going to be inconvenient. Mm. <laughs> there's, there's never a situation that God calls you to that's just perfectly convenient. Right. It's not. It's always outside of the comfort zone. Yeah. Something different, something new. Right. And, and that's, he's teaching us to trust him. Yeah. And we don't, we don't want that lesson, but I'm telling you, there, there's no better way to live life, right? That student, I still have, he's still struggling in addiction. He's still on the streets. But I have a strong relationship with him. Hmm. And every few months he'll circle back around and mm -hmm. we're able to just love on him again. Hmm. And that wouldn't have happened if I'd met him with rejection in that moment. Right. God knew that. I didn't right. know that. Sure. No. <laughs> and, and, and you can't apply what you that situation. The next time it comes around, God might speak something different. Right. That yeah. doesn't mean that's the solution no, that's not to always, every, exactly. every situation you're confronted with like right. that. Right. No, it, it doesn't. And so you have to just be listening, Right. which is terrifying because we just want God to give us rules that we can follow on our own because then we're back in control. Give us a rule book. Give right. us a rule book. But yeah, we can't, we can't cookie cutter it. Right. And we want that rule book, and it, it, it comes down to control. Why do we want the rule book? Why did the Israelites want the rule book? Mm -hmm. It's so they could have control and right. still say they were serving God. Sure. Right? Oh, Absolutely. I'm following God's rules. Absolutely. Right? And, it, I mean, checklists are just easier. <laughs> they are. <laughs> and because that's he's not called us to checklists. He's called us to relationships. Right. And relationship requires that we're daily investing in it and that we're listening and that we're being open in communication with him. Mm. And that that's more than what we... That's more than what we want. Mm -hmm. we had another young man who did not interact with us. He came in, he got coffee, and he would sit and study, sit and study, sit and study. Uh, for a whole year, mm -hmm. we saw him and didn't know his name. And it wasn't for lack of trying. It was, he just was... <laughs> he was just into what he was doing. He, he was not yes. a conversational person. He was here every day. And 
he graduated, moved on, and two years later, one of our board members at the Salvation Army stumbled onto him at a park. Hmm. He was a forest ranger at a park. And uh, they were chatting and, and talking about where they were from. And the, the board member said, oh, yeah, I'm from Cleveland. And he said, oh, I used to go to this coffee house in Cleveland. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I went there every day in my senior year. And that coffee house saved my life. Wow. I, was, I was suicidal. And when I would get suicidal and I didn't have friends on campus, I didn't know where to go. But I'd been there and it felt safe. Wow. And so I would go there and I would sit and study. And most of the time I was fighting off tears and pretending to study. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't, they, they probably don't even know my name because I never talked to them. Mm. But that, that space saved my life. And so, for, for yeah, how, how can coffee uh, save a life, right? Yeah. Like, it's, it's not even about the coffee. It's about just having that place where he had been once and felt safe here. Mm-hmm. He didn't even know why at the time, but eventually his coming and just being around us, he knew that you know we were a ministry center for, for whatever intents and purposes. It never led to a prayer time for him, but it saved him, mm-hmm. right? Well, it's a so, powerful story. Yeah. You know, we don't... <clears throat> you know, I'm a believer that most times... Not most times. A lot of times when we are doing ministry work, when we're just doing faith, being faithful to what God's called yeah. us to do, then things happen around us that we we, we will never even, never know until we get right. to heaven one day. Right. right. That we even had an impact or an influence. Yeah. I mean, that is a case in point. I mean, you, you can't put a dollar value on that story no. because it encourages you so much just right. to keep doing what you're doing. I mean, I was... Yeah. I got chills going on down my spine. Just, <laughs> and, and my favorite just part hearing. about that story is there's not a person attached to it. It's yeah. not. It's not that he had an interaction with me or with right. one of the baristas or, right. or any of that. It's that we were just faithful to set up the place that God told us to set right. up and right. to show up every day that He told us to show up. Right. And yeah, we'd never. We had, I had no idea. I saw right. him every day. Right. And he was just the studying kid who wouldn't talk to anybody. Right. <laughs> but had no idea what God was doing. Wow. But. God's faith, you being faithful to what God calls you to do doesn't require you to know. Mm-hmm. And if that's if I've learned anything, it's that, right? I don't I don't get to know the end plan. Right. I don't at this point, I've stopped asking. Right. <laughs> because I, I know what the answer is gonna be. Right. right. Just trust me. Right. Just trust me for today. A friend of mine asked me to go to Madagascar. It's the big island all, all, over in the mm-hmm. Indian Ocean. Mm-hmm. And I'd been to most of the countries in Africa, but I'd never been to Madagascar. And I said no. And he's our, he's our ministry partner in South Africa. And year after year, he kept asking me. He said, I know why you don't want to go. And I said, why? He said, because you're afraid. I said, what do you think I'm afraid of? He said, you're afraid that God will call you to do something there. And I said, that might be it, because I'm pretty busy. I said, when you find a, an opportunity for training church leaders there, then I'll go. Mm-hmm. So he calls me not long, uh, not too long after. He said, not only do I have a, uh, a denomination that would like to use your training. Uh, but uh, we're going pretty soon. And so we went, and we had uh, my wife went, and there were 106 people that wanted to go through those courses. Mm-hmm. What I didn't know is this local church in the capital city uh, had decided this is our school of missions. And this comes back to what a local church can do. This is a local church in one of the poorest countries in the world. They're in the bottom five, Madagascar. Oh, wow. And they decided because they had done a study and found there are 200 villages in Madagascar where there was no church. Hmm. And so they asked their people to volunteer to be missionaries, that the church would well, send them out to their own people. Right. But they needed some training. Mm-hmm. That's who we were teaching. Wow. Well, not all, what we didn't know is also was that they were going to be going pretty soon. And they even had to go a few times for short-term trips before they moved to these villages. And they came back within a year and had stories of four areas where they found the people, the Bible had never been translated into their local language. Mm. So they asked, would we help? Mm. Frankly, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Right. I've got a good friend that's with Wicked Bible Translation. I thought, nah, that's, just, that's not true. Certainly, there are four, you know, languages. Right. Right? So I called my friend at Wycliffe. I said, what do you know about the Tishomiti language? He said, oh, it's out of Madagascar. I said, what about Bastilio? Yeah, that's another one. I said, you know, between those two groups, there's a million people that speak that language. And they say there's, the Bible's never been translated. That's not true, is it? He said, it is true. Hmm. 
So what's happened in the last year is people from that church, there were many that did know that language and working with other uh, linguistics experts, they have translated the whole Bible in Bestilio. Wow. And we had it printed in Korea. It left uh, this month on a ship and it'll be in, uh, in Madagascar next month. Wow. How many were you able to print? We printed 10,000. And, the, and the, the amazing thing is this is all the work was done by local people from a local church. We mm -hmm. just paid for it. Right. And so uh, before it was even finished, they wanted to start evangelizing. So we had the book of John. They started playing it on the radio broadcast, broadcasting into these areas. And they would read a different chapter. They read the whole book of John, a different chapter every day. Hmm. And then they went around house to house, invited people to come to a, a meeting. And, and thousands of people showed up. Hmm. And people came to Christ. And one of the people on the team asked someone who had just come to Christ, why did you even come to this? He said, because I heard on the radio God speaking my language. Wow. That's one of my favorite stories. I had no idea I'd ever be involved at all in Bible translation. And you didn't even want to go to Madagascar. No, I didn't want to go to Madagascar. <laughs> and I, I've, 40 years in ministry, I've never been involved in translations. That's yeah. that's the way the Lord, he's looking for, you know, the available. And mm -hmm. and, and then he, he shows up. Wow. There's a, a ministry counterpart in Atlanta that works for Salvation Army who had a similar kind of journey into the Army, kind of stumbled into it by mm -hmm. accident. Um, but... Her, her kind of coming to grips with calling was when she met someone who worked at a strip club. And she met them at Angel Tree. Hmm. And they just couldn't afford to pay all of their bills. And right. they, it, it was a strip club that was really a, a front for a lot of other things. And it, just a mess. Mm -hmm. And so she said, yeah, a lot of the girls who work down there are in the same spot. So this lady, who my ministry counterpart in Atlanta said, do you mind if I come down there? Showed up at her work, wow, with a basket, and said, "Hey, where's your where's your boss?" <laughs> and so went and talked to the boss and said, "Listen, I've got a basket of goodies for your girls. Do you mind if I just take it back mm -hmm. to their dressing room?" Mm -hmm. Started taking goodies back there. Realized they're bringing their kids to work because they didn't have anywhere else to go. She opens up a little daycare inside the strip club. Oh, wow. Starts getting other lady volunteers to come in, and they mm -hmm. come in before the shift. And they said, "Listen, we don't have to agree with what you're doing, but these kids, we want to help you." Mm -hmm. And so in the dressing rooms in the back, the Salvation Army is doing VBSs with, with, <laughs> with the kids, Whoa. right? And, and their moms are being ministered to every single day, being cared for mm -hmm. every single day. And it's not every day, but when, when one comes and says, I want out, who do they go to? Right. They call their mama. Right. Because most of them had not had a mother figure. Mm -hmm. And so they, they said, when I know when I need something or when I need out, I go to mama. Mm. And man, if more church people had a reputation like that mm -hmm. in the world, mm. we would be a different place. Mm. I told you that we were uh, kidnapped in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And we were on the way to a village, walking from our house to a village called Haruma. And we never got there that day. Uh, but... Two years later, I, later I got there, another way in my car, <laughs> and found a lady that uh, had a little uh, adult education program. And after getting to know her, she said, "You know, the kids here don't even go to high school. There's no high school around here. Some of them finish eighth grade, but nobody goes to high school because they can't afford it." Mm -hmm. So again, long story short, some people in Nashville here helped me, and we we built a high school. It was made out of shipping containers. Wow. I have to show you a picture sometimes. It's a yeah. beautiful building. It's amazing what you can do with shipping containers. <laughs> and at the very first graduation, uh, Mary and I were living there, and these kids were going just going to high school, and uh, they advised to come to the graduation, and so we decided we'd give them all as a graduation present. After they got their diploma, we'd give them a Bible. Mm -hmm. It was a Christian school, but a lot of them still didn't have a, have a Bible. And... Kind of as a last minute thing, Mary's writing a little card to the 32 graduates. Right. And I said, let's put some money in that envelope. A uh, thousand shillings is 10 US dollars. Mm -hmm. So I put a thousand shilling note, they call it. Mm -hmm. Like a $10 bill. Right. And I didn't think anything else about it. We gave right. it to them. 
About a year later, the headmaster of that school called me and said, have you heard what happened to John Wanjaru? I didn't know. I thought maybe he got killed. I didn't know. I know. I haven't had any contact with him. She said, would you be willing to meet with him? I said, sure. She said, let's pick a place. And I picked a place. She called him. He comes up in a taxi cab, steps out in a suit, and walks over and has lunch with me. Hmm. And I said, well, the headmaster says I should ask what's been happening to you. He said, well, it's just the Lord. and uh, But I do want to thank you for the gift of the, of the thousand shillings. Can I tell you how, how the Lord used that? I said, yeah. He said, you know, I didn't even know I was in that Bible. I had my diploma in my Bible, and I walked back home about six miles. Mm. And, uh, and then when I got home, I opened it, and I saw the envelope and the card. And when I pulled that out, he said, you know, I never held that much money in my hand in my life, $10. Mm. Mm. He, he is raised by a single mother, eight siblings, and... Uh, he said, uh, so I knew this was a gift from God. Mm. I'd worked, I'd had jobs, uh, but this was a gift. So he said, for the next three days, I kept it in my pocket. And I walked around my village and I prayed, God, how would you have me use this $10? Because I believe it's for my future. And he talked to the guy repairing bicycles and he talked to the people selling vegetables on the side of the street. He talked to the guy repairing shoes, but he said, I kept kind of being drawn back to this guy that was selling eggs. And I started asking him a lot of questions about his business. Finally, he said, well, I could use some help. And he said, well, I'd rather not work for you. I'd like to work with you. How many eggs can I buy for a thousand shillings? And he bought trays. And the guy said, I'll sell them to you at this price. I suggest you sell them at this price. The only condition is, you got to go sell them on the other side of the village. <laughs> and he started with that. Mm -hmm. He doubled his money the first day. Wow. And then he did more and more. And then he got to go meet the people at the farm. He started getting it directly. By then he had to buy a bicycle. You can't ride with eggs on, on your bike. But he said, I would push my bicycle loaded with crates of eggs. Wow. Until he got to the point that he got four other guys and bought them bicycles. And then he started renting a taxi cab that he would go down there. And besides those four guys, he'd get a whole taxi cab full of eggs and go to another village. By the time I met John, he said, uh, this, at the restaurant, he said, uh, and now I have a shop. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, we sell all kinds of stuff, but we do sell eggs. <laughs> and I still have these four guys selling mm -hmm. eggs over there. Right. And he said, do you remember my brother Peter? I said, yeah. He graduated with you. He said, yeah. He's a couple years younger, but we graduated at the same time because I didn't go to school for two years after elementary school. And then we heard about the New Dawn Academy, and so we came together. Well, uh, he's in university. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm paying for him to go to school. Wow. He said, I'm married too. Would you like to meet my wife? I said, sure. I, said, I, 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 I gave him a ride back to the shop. I met his wife. And she said, oh, have you told, told him about your brother? She said, yeah, I told him in, in school. Fast forward to the end of the story. Uh, John put his brother all the way through school. He's a surgeon at the Nairobi uh, uh, General Hospital now. Wow. He put two more of his brothers through school. One is in medical school now, one as, a, as an engineer. And he still has this, that one shop. Then he got a place downtown. He's basically a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. And last year, he got an opportunity to come to the U.S. to go to college himself. Mm. And if he told this story, every other phrase would be, and then God provided. Mm. And then God provided this, and then God provided that. Mm. That is one of my favorite stories. Wow, that is a tremendous story of what God can do with $10. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot. I didn't prep you for this one. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, since I'm down here and we, we're going to be doing a little hunting, Lord willing, over the next couple of days, Give us a give us a hunting story. You got you got a good hunting story in there somewhere. A hunting story. Well, I'll tell you what. We were 
we were teenagers. Uh, just I probably had just graduated high school, and Scotty was still in high school. And he had took up bow hunting. <laughs> he was trying to, he was going to bow hunt a little bit, you know. And so he he was over there, and he had seen a few, but he had this opportunity. And on this particular day, a nice eight point came in, and he he drew back and he shot and I didn't I, I didn't say this story had to be about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, there's a couple coming to mind, it, but this one. All right, I'm sorry. Go he, ahead. He, okay, he, it's nice eight point. I nice was drawn back point. on it. He so. drawn back on and he he shoots the the deer and and he hits it. I mean, and so. He comes to the house, and Daddy is not home because at this time he's working shift work, and so he's gone to work, and it's uh, late in the, in the evening. But we had we had some uh, hounds uh, that uh, so we give it. We went over there, and we we was kids. <laughs> First off, we didn't wait long enough, you know. Boy, we all excited, and so we went out there and got the one dog that you know we felt most confident in trailing, and we put her on a leash. Now, she's a big dog, pretty good size. She's a walker hound. And we go to through the woods. I've got the dog. Scotty's got the light. And we're we're following the blood trail. And we get the dog there. And she takes off. And for any of you that's never done that, that when you get a big grown dog and you take off, she can go places you can't go. And you're trying to keep up with her. And I, th and I think it's important. For people to realize the woods down here are, are not there are, nice and open like not, a lot no. of them in Tennessee are. Down here, everything is is a thicket. It's a thicket. I mean, it's a it, you, you kind of almost have got to have a machete to walk through this stuff. And and we've got we've got what we call cat claws. And I when I say this, I'm talking about bamboo type vines that is bigger than your finger that has thorns off of them that look like they come off of a tiger. <laughs> and uh, and we're running through, and it's pitch black now with a flashlight, and I'm up front, and Scotty's trying to keep the light so I can see a little bit, and all of a sudden I hear somebody holler, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around, and I took my little light, and I shined back there on Scotty, and one of those cat claw briars has hooked him in the <laughs> eyelid and it has his eyelids stretched just as far and he and it's and it's limber and he's trying his best to stay just as close to that vine as he can because every time he pulls it just pulls a little bit farther and uh, I had to stop and and help him and we got him unhooked and proceeded on the chase after we had us a little laugh. It was a lot funnier to me, probably, than it was to him at the time. Now, the sad part of the story is we never did find that deer. Uh, the blood trail, I mean, the, uh, the blood trail finally ran out, and uh, if I'd have turned the dog loose, she might would have caught him, and we might could have got him that way, but Daddy wasn't around, and we didn't want to lose the dog, and we didn't have any way, and we was just on foot, and so uh, we sure thought we was going to find it, but we never did find that deer, but that is one one story that uh, to see it, and to see it was uh, really funny. Uh, I know for I, him, for me, uh, you know, I, I could uh, probably, I could probably tell you the story that he would tell if he was telling one on me. But, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Yeah, was, I got some stories. We'll get, we we'll might get just the, do that one we'll, day. But. We might just do that one day. Sit down and tell some stories because we got some good ones. But those are, you know, those are some of the good things that come out of family and and doing things together and sharing some experience. So that was a good story, and appreciate you sharing it, even if it was on me. <laughs> I, every year I try to go out west for an elk hunt. Um, I love the mountains and it's quite good therapy for me to break away and um, get out of cell phone service for a while. And um, so in September, I'll try to head to Colorado or Idaho or New Mexico. And uh, this, this last September, actually, I guess the September before, um, we, uh, I was in Idaho, up near Cascade, Idaho. And I was blessed enough to be able to, to shoot an elk. This is all archery hunting. Uh, to shoot an elk, I think, on the second day of the hunt. 
and uh, I was hunting with two buddies, and so they were still going for for elks, and and uh, I wanted to be legally be on the mountain with them, so I, I went into town, and I I bought a bear tag, and <laughs> uh, it was just a way for somewhat you know affordable way for me to still legally be on the mountain with a bow, and who knows if we we hadn't seen any bear, but maybe we would, I don't know. So I was just going primarily to help call for them and help them try to get on get on an elk. And so I'm, I'm with my buddy, and, and what I what I didn't realize we were we were in this little thicket on on this uh, finger that came off the mountain, and uh, it mountain dropped off on each side and dropped off in front of us. And uh, there's a lot of elk sign in there. And what I didn't realize is that um, there was an elk carcass uh, that I didn't know about just off the mountain this way, and off the other side of the mountain down a ways was the elk carcass, um, my old elk carcass that I had shot. We had of course. Uh, harvested it, but there is still sure. uh, remains there, and uh, and so we were in. We knew that we were in on the edge of grizzly bear territory. So there's a lot of black bear out there, but there's also some grizzly bear, and um, they they weren't common, but they had told us that it causes the black bear to become a little more aggressive, maybe than than mm. uh, they might usually be, and uh, for that purpose, I always carried a pistol. Um, most of the natives out there don't. Uh, they laugh at this Texan <laughs> carrying, carrying a gun, but um, well, Texans got to have the shoot the six shooter right. on the side, right? And so um, we were going to carry uh, cover a lot of miles that day. And I was as we, we were leaving the base of the mountain, I parked my truck at the base of the mountain. We were going to make this long climb, climb early in the morning, and uh, and my friend compelled me he says man we're going a long ways today that pistol's extra weight you're not going to need that we haven't seen any bear you should just leave it here and i thought ah you're right so i left it in the trunk and we were <laughs> <laughs> all those decisions <laughs> yeah. you make. <laughs> so so i'm i'm there on the on the top of this mountain and and uh i'm calling for my buddy we're about 30 yards apart and i can see down the thicket, and all of a sudden i uh I, I hear something growl behind me, bark at me. And I knew that, you know, I, I hadn't had any close encounters with bears, but I knew what it was. God spoke to my soul. <laughs> some things, when you're in the outdoors, sometimes you just, you never have to have, to have experienced yeah. it previously. You just know. And it was like, he was, I was like I could feel his breath on my back. There was a big thicket, sumac thicket right behind me. And uh, I, I jumped up and I had my bow and my buddy's looking at me like, what are you doing? I was like, Right here, right? And so, I was, but there was nowhere to go, you know? And uh, and I looked down the thicket, and there's this like path coming into it. And all of a sudden, I just hear like, boom, like a sack of taters hitting the ground. And there's this, this dust kind of rolls in. And as it clears, there's this big black body. And with a head doing this, I'm like, oh my, there he is, you know? And so, <laughs> he's on a mission, you know? And so, I couldn't, I couldn't get a shot at him there. And plus, I have a bow, you know, and this is a large bear. And uh, I'm like, what? And your pistol's in the truck. Yeah, no pistol. <laughs> so he meanders in a bit and then turns around and backs out and goes off the mountain. I'm like, oh, okay. So my buddy and I, we gather together. I'm like, okay, um, uh, I would love to get a shot on this bear because I'd love to shoot one. I really wasn't that scared, um, except when he breathed on the back of my neck. But <laughs> we got to looking around, and we watched that bear leave and go down the side of the mountain. And then my buddy says, look over there. And back over this way, there was one standing up, looking over the thicket, like looking at us. And I was like, I was like, two bear. And I couldn't get a shot at it either. And it dropped. And I was like, uh, where did that go? You know? <laughs> so now we're getting higher and higher alert. We look off the mountain on this end, and there's a, um, a big, big bear coming for us. And I think, looking back, I think it was a grizzly. It was a big bear. And, and entered a thicket way down the mountain from us, so about 200 yards away, and headed our way. And I was like, that thicket, I guess it has a trail in it. I wonder where it comes out. And then I looked right in front of me, and there's this, <laughs> there's this opening of this, of this trail, you know? And I'm like, it comes out right there. And I, <laughs> and I could see like the bushes moving as it's getting closer. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm back up with my bow, and I think I'm gonna have to shoot this bear like five yards. And, and then it just, and then the, the bushes stop, which is like the worst thing to me. 
Because I'd rather know where the bear is. You know, it's kind of right. like if you're out on a surfboard in the ocean and you see a shark fin coming for you and it gets towards you and then it just goes under. You're like, uh... You know? exactly. <laughs> at least I would rather... Yeah, yeah. The at least I know where to punch, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, no. And then there's... Um, and then a, another bear, a fourth wow. bear, uh, was up on top of the mountain walking down. And we realized we're surrounded, literally. And so I was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. I said, what? We, we're going to have to go through bear to get off this mountain. I said, let's just get back to back. Because there's like four or five pathways into this thicket we were in. And you couldn't shoot past about 20 yards in any direction. I said, let's just get back to back. I'll watch this side of the mountain. You watch that side of the mountain. And if we see bear, we'll, we'll let each other know. So we both had arrows knocked, and we're just like back to back. It was like a cartoon. <laughs> we were like spinning around. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so silly, but not, but not really. I was like, these are real bears. These aren't fake bears. Right. These, so these, are, these are wild bears. Yeah, so I don't, not the yeah, I don't feel that here. silly, you know? And, um, and so... Um, he elbowed me. He's like, Bear! and I looked, and, and and one was coming in uh, pretty uh, fearlessly, and I I talked. Oh, whoa, bear! And he didn't care. And uh, and so anyway, he's, imagine that. Yeah. So he's he's coming. And he's not charging, but he's confidently walking toward me. And I I got down. I squatted down so I could have a, a clear, more clear look at him because it was a thicket. And he's just looking at me, and he's. And then he just puts his head down and he just keeps coming. He's about 15 yards at this point. And I think, what am I going to do? I've just got this arrow and I know, I know enough about it. got a him. sharp stick here. Yeah, and I've, I've shot enough things. I, I know um, anatomy-wise that it's not going to do anything right. if I shoot him. It's, you know, and so, but I'm, I'm drawn back and I'm just thinking, am I just going to shoot him in the mouth? I mean, I'm, and then I thought, I had this horrible thought. I'm like, even if I shoot him through the heart, he can kill me before he runs out of oxygen. <laughs> like, there's no good remedy, you know, solution yeah, to this. Right. It's like, even if I make the perfect shot, uh, he's on top of me because he's not going to like me after I shoot him. And so I'm just, I'm drawn back and he's just still coming. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And he, for whatever reason, he turns his head. He didn't turn his body, he just turns his head to look at something. And the Holy Spirit said to me, shoot. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I thought, there's a chance to, to maybe catch his spine. And uh, so I shot, and the Lord guided that, thy arrow. <laughs> and, and I dropped him. I dropped wow. him out there about 15 yards from me. He, I, it, was a, it was over like that. And he just rolled down the, down the mountain. So... Um, then I was like, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you try to trail Banjo Ben. No, it didn't really go like that. My knees started knocking. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure at that point in time you were probably yeah. shaking off. Oh, over. That's man. That adrenaline. Yeah. That adrenaline yeah. rush. So it was, it, was really, it was really neat because it was simultaneously the, the most exciting moment I've ever had in the woods and the best shot that I've ever made under pressure and I thought that was pretty neat that those two things aligned because I, I don't know if I could really make that shot again because couldn't really see him he's black and it's kind of dark and I'm just putting it in there somewhere and I managed to pierce his spinal cord so wow. um so anyway we just lost all of our PETA listeners but um, <laughs> <laughs> well you know, self-defense you know it, is a justifiable there you go. reason there you go. so there you go well that's interesting I mean those kind of experiences I, I, obviously, you never forget those right. things. Uh, you talk about them until you die. <laughs> uh, and in this case, you got to bring home the bear, yeah. the bear skin. Yeah. And maybe you got a rug right here somewhere. Yeah. But you know, the, it's it's just fun. That's why we get out. And oh yeah. Those kind yeah. Of things. So yeah. You probably don't remember, but I do. Our very first Valentine's Day. We were living Probably don't remember. <laughs> because there's a lot of things I don't remember. We were living in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and you were in the Air Force, and I was all excited. Our first Valentine's Day, Mary. And uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. Uh -oh, you you feel here. it coming. And Scotty, you got me a book on houseplants. You got me. And, and I cried. 
<laughs> I cried. Oh. I couldn't help it. Well, I mean, you can learn more from that book than you can learn from like a dozen roses, right? I guess so. I just didn't know that then. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, flowers, candy, chocolate. But Scotty was thinking, this will be a benefit. <laughs> this is a solution. <laughs> All the stories of marriage, all the missed opportunities. <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Inner Fire Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, we ask that you give us a five-star rating or share it with a friend who you think would enjoy it too. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube or follow us on social media if you haven't done so already. And until next time, God bless you.